Hide it. And we are live, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, welcome to the Reasonably Fine Art Talk. Today is part two, part two with Scott Murdoch. Thank you for joining us, Scott. You're down in North Carolina. You're at uh, in Susan's studio again because you have I mean, my non-existent internet up where you live. Exactly. And I got me out of my cave to talk to you. It's exciting. <laughs> excellent. And ladies and gentlemen, we have the great Betty Sue back with us this week. She is done with the Outlaw Country Cruise. She is home for a week before she goes out on tour with James McMurtry and Chris Smither. Uh, so we are blessed to have her with us. She's pulling the strings in the background. Um, and so, Scott, let's just get going with uh, taking things from where we did last week. Betty Sue, can you okay. make our hands really small? Yeah, there. So anyway, welcome, Scott. Let's talk about some art. Sure. Let's just dive right in. Set us off here. Uh, let's see. Well, this is a small painting. Um Gosh, what is this, like 12 by 20, I think? And um, this is one actually, uh, Sue, when she's, sometimes when she does workshops, uh, like online workshops, I'll come and run the camera for her. Uh, I think she was doing a workshop for Scottsdale last year during the kind of when shut, things were shut down. And so I started this uh, as a drawing while I was running the camera for her and then kept painting on it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so... These are kind of fun for me. I don't necessarily know where I'm going to go with this. I just started from a photograph I'd taken of one of our models, uh, Maya, right. and uh, then just started sketching it out and just kind of, you know, playing around with her being a tree and, you know, and then putting things in the background and kind of just the things I'd been thinking about at that time, you know, the all the environmental things. Um, I think I was doing this when we were first I had been, we were, I was excited. We were finally able to get uh, solar panels and uh, electric car and all that. And so I've been really researching that, but I've just always been involved in environmental issues. And I mean, mm -hmm. it's a big thing I think about. And so those things just come out in the, in the painting. So, now, yeah. so, so, so this, the thing I think is really interesting about this is that this isn't really one of your, you know, it's not taken to a high level of finish. Um, and it sounds like I did not know the process that led through led to this, but it sounds like you just you let it organically develop. Uh, it's almost a psychological exercise. And do you do you view? I mean, I see this in a frame now. Would this go into a show, or would you just kind of stash it away as a this is an intermediate step to a truly finished uh, piece that you'd do at another time. Yeah, might, I mean, uh, it's possible things. that I could do this as a big painting sometime. But yeah, I literally started this on, just on a wood panel and then as a drawing just mm -hmm. to pass the time. And then I really liked the idea. And so then I, I just sealed that uh, like with polyurethane and then I painted on top of it. Um, uh -huh. And then someone saw it uh, when I posted it on Instagram uh, and bought it. Uh, and so, um, a, a wonderful artist, uh, uh, that I think he's from Norway, if I remember correctly. And, um, so, so yeah, so then I just, he just bought it and I just popped it in this frame that I had and, uh, and sent it to him then. So I, I didn't put it in a show. I, I might, I, I might've put it in a show. I, or done a bigger painting. I have so many paintings going in my studio and I'm really kind of, especially now, I really just don't think about what show things are going to go to. I just paint things and I have things in different stages. And a lot of things are experiments that don't come out. Um, yeah, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that a little, because I think especially since so much of our audience is, is our people who are on their journey as painters. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, people are sometimes surprised when they come into my studio and they'll see that there are six or seven pieces, some of which have a lot of cat hair on them that have not mm -hmm. been worked on for a while, you know, but they're, they're still sort of alive. And then there is a box of, you know, 30 or 40 paintings that are currently dead. Uh, you know, talk a little about the, the number of pieces that you'd have going at any given time and the, the surprisingly high percentages of non-keepers that, that exist, and do you paint over them? 
Uh, do you, you know, Patrick Lee just will start painting another painting directly on top of a dead painting without, you know, without sanding it down or gessoing it or anything. He'll just use that as kind of the leaping off point of something completely different. Can you expound a little on that? Yeah, I do that uh, quite a bit now. Um, I used to, I, I mean, more than like, I used to just always like to do my painting and then finish it before I started another painting. Um, and I'd say about 10 years ago, I slowly started to get away from that. And maybe five years ago, I've really gone to painting things in stages and, and experimenting a lot. So I have, I probably have like 20 paintings going in the studio right now. And then other ones that I abandon, I'll put in the racks, probably have another hundred like that. Uh -huh. And some of those I'll take out and look at them and think, oh, this is actually pretty good. There's just a few things I need to do to it. And then others, I will completely repaint it. Um, and then others, like I have one that's going to the Selma Gundy, uh, a show at the Selma Gundy show um, that I just shipped out. And it's a profile of, of one of our models, Rose. And I had done a whole painting on that one and just didn't like it. Put it aside for like, uh, I don't know, maybe a year and a half, two years. And then I, I sanded it down a bit because it was quite thick. And then I just repainted it over a completely different painting of her on top of that. So really all of the above, I just will keep working on things and keep changing it or layering it. Um, I rarely throw it out because I will, I really see that as a good opportunity, especially when something's failed or when I get something back from a show. A lot of times the fact that I've got it back, and it didn't sell and it's sitting there, I just start thinking about it and I almost feel like I have permission now to really play with it because mm -hmm. sometimes I'm afraid to work on it more and I'm like, gosh, you know, I really do kind of like this. Uh, a lot of times they're a little more traditional and then when I get it back, I'm like, okay, now I can just go crazy, you know, just <laughs> really, really lose a lot of stuff and make it more abstract. Um, so I see that as an opportunity um, to mm -hmm. just experiment when... Uh, when it's not working out or when I get the painting back and I, I, you know, and Sue will get mad sometimes because sometimes I will ruin a lot of paintings that way. Um, mm -hmm. But it is, know. it is sad when, when you, when you do have, when you're, when you've got one that's at 66% and you say, oh, I can easily get this to 85% and you take it down to 22%. Yeah. Right. That's you know, the well, once, you, once you've varnished it, though, it's kind of nice because then you can work over it if it's an older painting and you can wash it down again if you don't like it. So mm, that's true. So, OK, that that's a that's expound a little on that, that you feel comfortable if there's a finished painting that has varnish on it, then working on it some more. And if it works out well, would you just varnish it again? So it's painting, varnish, painting, varnish. Exactly. That's, yeah. That's yeah. Right. And if it doesn't work out, then you just remove it. And the varnish is designed to be removable. Well, so I don't even that. remove the varnish. It's like I use a salivar, which is an acrylic based. So it's like mm -hmm. acrylics. So when you paint over that, if within the next day or two, you just decide you don't like it or just portions of it, you can just use some uh, Gamsol and you can just wash it off. And it's just got the regular painting there again. Right. And then if you like it, um, you let that dry thoroughly, uh, you know, over months, and then you can varnish it again, and you've got that layer. So it's just, it feels just like painting over gesso because right. it's an acrylic base. Um, so but it's, you know, th th that's the thing that's confusing to people because I, I use that high VOC acrylic varnish at times, and that – it is acrylic, but it's not acrylic like acrylic paint is acrylic in that water isn't the binder uh, right. that's going on there. And that's just, people get very confused about that. So like you're using an acrylic varnish on top of an oil painting, you can't do that. Well, <laughs> right. you, you can with the high VOC stuff. Right. But you also exactly. want it to be very, very well ventilated at the time. You know, yes, that's, that's, definitely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I have like an exhaust fan in my studio and all that. So yeah, it's... Uh, yeah. Now, th this painting is from uh, our uh, one of our, our last trip that we took to India um, a couple of years ago. And uh, this is, again, an another one of those things where I love to we will have model in the morning pretty much ever, always. And we'll do something from life or like three or four hours. And then we'll go off 
and explore. And so we, we hire a driver for the time we're there uh, who from the local area uh, who knows everybody. And so we'll drive around. So we drove, we're driving up and we went to this, uh, there was this kind of old temple-ish thing, but it was kind of a ruins, um, really no tourists in this area. Uh, so it was just empty. And so we went up to it and uh, there was a couple girls out front who were just out of school there from the local village there. And, uh, and so I just had uh, through our translator and Suchitra Bosle was also with us so she could speak uh, with them and uh, just said, oh, can I hire you to pose for us, you know, for some, for some photographs. And they were very excited. And so we posed for them. This little girl was just kind of hanging around on the outside, kind of watching us as we took photographs of the three other girls that we hired. So I took photographs of them. And this girl was just kind of, she would climb up into the temple, would watch us, always be looking at us. And so I would take pictures and every once and again, once in a while, I would take a picture of her, like up in the thing. And she was just like so interested. And uh, then at the end, um, uh, I went up to her and she kind of came over and I gave her some money for the photographs I took of her. And she was so surprised and excited. And I showed her a couple of pictures on our, on our phone and everything. And uh, I did some paintings of the other girls too, but I just loved her. And that's kind of one of my favorite things is to take pictures of people who I'm not actually setting up. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I just loved her with the, with the, old, with the old ruins and the, the stuff. And, so, and it was fun too, because when I painted her, just like I do a lot of times, when you take these photos, they're so quick. Um, and you notice things that you didn't notice when you took the photograph. Like so for like her, I noticed that her like her shoes are her, her sandals are two different colors. They were completely different. You know, they were just obviously hand-me-downs or things that she found, you know, on the street to use as her sandals. And so it's kind of interesting all these things that you see uh, in working on it later mm -hmm. from the photograph. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. now, now one again a technical just a couple technical questions what size is this is this piece approximately this one i think was 30 by 30 inches okay so yeah and i did this just in my studio when we got home um it was during covid so i was just doing a whole bunch of paintings from photographs and this is one that i didn't play too much with technique or anything i just i just loved the uh loved it as it was i needed to change uh a lot of things because the photograph itself distorted some of the perspective and stuff like that. So when I sketched it out, I was careful about kind of trying to fix some of that, uh, some of those things. But other than that, I just really used kind of a more of a blue and brown sort of palette with a little bit of the red and, and purple right. in there and just, you know, painted it fairly simple. And you've got those beautiful luminous uh, warm shadows, uh, the, the, the dark browns and stuff. It's a, it's a, it's a lovely piece, especially the way, that you choose to have it come alive in the lower left quadrant of it, you know. So yeah. Jeff uh, is saying, oh, hey, Jeff. Well, we're glad you're here, even if you are late. Let's have the Jeff next is the, Jeff is the, is the one who bought that painting of the girl turning into the tree that you showed first. It's called oh, Magnum really? Mater. He is, he's, and he's a really great artist as well. And he had, I think, seen it on Instagram and bought it through that. Yeah. So it's nice to see you, Jeff. <laughs> And is this another, this is another, is that from the same trip? This is from that same trip. This is from Udaipur. Uh, and we, we had gone there on a previous trip to Udaipur for just a couple days. And we loved it so much uh, that we decided when we went back on this last trip, where we painted with um, Pramod Kurlinkar, who is a really great artist. We kind of think of him as the, uh, the Sergeant of India. He's such an incredible painter. And so we painted with him at his village, uh, you know, um, his parents' village. Uh, and then we, we came up to, for like a week there, and then we came up to, um, uh, to Udaipur we, during when they were going to have a festival for three days. So for those three days, I actually didn't paint in the morning every day. I would paint a little landscape, but we wouldn't have models. And I would just go out and take photographs because there was just so much happening. All the people who would go through the streets for all those three days. And so this was, and it's kind of like an exhausting thing to, get out there in the crowds and the photographs and just try and get in there and get your pictures. And um, so, and this is just a wonderful thing where the women would bring, bring uh, um, their little dolls that they would make uh, of, of their gods and God and goddesses. Uh, 
and um, they would bring them down to the edge of the water. And so I, I, I take thousands and thousands of photographs um, and try and get my references and get things that have more of an emotional context, you know, that, and so that's what I'm excited about is kind of documenting uh, those, those things and just finding something that has more emotion to it. Um, and so that's what I liked about uh, this. This was a couple, I think two photos I combined together where I liked the head of the girl, the way she was looking. And then I liked the pose from a different picture and, and where the hand is reaching out kind of a, kind of holding on to her to keep her from say falling into the water. So right. it was kind of, kind of neat. So, so when you, when you combine photos again, just in terms of technique for our, our, our viewers, are you doing that on the computer in Photoshop? Or are you physically, you know, sometimes I do that. Uh, most of the time I just put both pictures up on the screen, but sometimes I will combine them. Uh, and on our Patreon, I've done a couple demos where I've shown that the actual process of taking one photo and another photo. I did a bigger one recently that I did that. And I showed it on there where I, where I put one photo in a layer and I put the other photo and I just then kind of used a layer mask to, to reveal the, like, I think I just used the head from one and then the body from another photo I took of the model. And uh, so sometimes I do it in the computer. Uh, most often I do it just with, I did a really large painting, which I also, put on our Patreon video, it was one that took me a couple months to do. It's like uh, uh, four foot by six foot, and it's um, of a powwow uh, out west in Idaho that I took photographs of, and I used a whole bunch of different photographs of different people. And I've done that with some of the dancers that I'd done in, in of the Maasai and of the Himba. Uh, and the most important thing about that is that you're thinking about it as an artist who wants to do a painting rather than just as a photographer. So when I do photographs like that, um, where you have tons of people at a festival or dancing or a powwow or anything I'm taking pictures of, I, I put myself in one spot and I'll take a lot of photographs from that spot. Sometimes I have my camera on a tripod, sometimes I'm holding it, but I'm careful not to go up and down and move this way and that way. A photographer would just keep moving around and finding the right compositions because they are looking for that one photograph. Um, but as an artist, I will spend, I'll usually put myself in a spot and a lot of times it'll be like 15 minutes. I'll just shoot from that spot because everybody's moving so quickly all around you that if you just keep taking pictures, there's not even time. You might see one person is in this perfect pose later and another person's in this perfect pose in this photograph. But if you're in one spot, you have the same perspective, the lighting, everything matches so that whether you combine it in Photoshop or not, doesn't really matter. But what matters is that you have the same lighting and the same perspective so that you can pick and choose the people that you want. I can't remember exactly on this one. I might have chosen, like in the foreground, I might have also chosen different pictures from like the people in the foreground, the girl uh, on the left in the bottom and the, the hand on the right. I probably chose slightly, because I probably shot really quickly. Everything was happening here so quickly, but I probably shot at least you know, 20 photographs from this point of view and of this girl, because I had lots of photos of her looking different directions. And then the people in the foreground and the background were all moving. And so then I could just choose the exact things that I wanted to build my, my composition from. And it all matched. Because if I'd been moving this way or that way, then the lighting would be different. My point right. of view would be different. And then you, then you run into trouble trying to make up that stuff and make it all. That's, that's, a, really good, that's a really good tip about... Uh, thinking about taking photographs as an art reference as opposed to photographs for the sake of the photograph. That's, that's very cogent and helpful. I think that's terrific. And I, I think about that sometimes when I do workshops, because people will bring photographs to me to say, how would I, how would you paint this? And sometimes they'll have these pictures, like they want to combine together and it's like, they've moved so far. It's like one of them is like, uh, the light is all from the side and one is from the front and one is they've, they've shot down and they've shot up and uh, they'd ask, well, how would you correct for this perspective and things like this? And I have to tell them, you know, I, I wouldn't try to, I mean, you're right. just not going to get a good photograph that way. And that's why it's so important. I really emphasize this in our videos that we do on Patreon and stuff that so much of being an artist is putting the time in beforehand 
So I always say that at least half of the effort of a good painting happens before you start your painting. So putting time into getting the references you like, if lighting the model, setting up your poses, doing sketches beforehand, all of these things in preparation of the painting are, are at least, if not more important than when you sit down. Too many people snap off a quick photograph and then they go into the studio thinking, um, okay, you know, this is where the creative stuff happens. I mean, when we do a photo session, we'll, we'll have a model usually for at least two hours. And we just keep trying things. We keep trying things. And, and so that you get the one or two photos that are perfect, um, that's just the perfect gesture or pose. And then when it's on trips like this, I spend so much time going out and photographing. Uh, I might sit in a place for two hours waiting for just the right people to come by this interesting scene or lake. Um, and so that's, that's really putting your time in. And I see that in your work where you have such interesting uh, scenes that you find, probably just going out and scouting them and then finding the right lighting. I mean, you, that effort beforehand just mm -hmm. gets you a more interesting subject matter uh, to paint. Right. Well, I mean, I, I, a lot of people, we have the luxury of, of doing this for our careers. So we, the, the sexy bit, which people think is the painting bit, which is what they want to do, you know, when now I have now I have time to be an artist. I want to be painting. You know, right. um, we have the luxury of knowing that that is that is a veneer on top of all the work that goes beforehand, and that that I sometimes feel bad at workshops where people just they want to dive in and be an artist. You know, and the reality it's. It's why I never was a very good sign painter. Because really good sign painters spend a lot of time drawing straight lines and drawing curves and not making letter forms. And I wanted to, I wanted to make letter forms. Now I am going to just jump to what Jeff, Jeff's, Jeff was saying about the beauty of the warm, the reflected light is in your shadows, and that was also true of the India Palace, uh, the previous slide, and. That was a, when I first started painting with uh, the Putney painters, um, that was one of the things that was sort of a, a, a thing that I learned from Richard and Nancy about the warmth in shadows. You know, I, we tend to think of shadows as cool, as cold, but shadows have the, the darkest dark is, um, is, is, is usually pretty warm. So talk about yeah. that. That's absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, that's just kind of one of those things that we heard in art school. Uh, our teacher, my teacher, Bill Parks, you know, he had been a student of Bill Mosby, who had been Richard Schmidt's teacher. And all of those lessons came from, you know, uh, Europe, all those artists that studied in Europe and they came mm -hmm. back and taught in the United States. And it's kind of just a truth. And, and I don't know why it is that our tendency is all of us are to make the darks blue. I know that when I was in school, that was that was something that I did. I would, when I started painting, you know, you get to the nostril and I would want to make it a dark blue. I just thought it was, you know, dark. And, uh, you know, when you start to realize, no, compare it to something like our teacher would hold up a, um, a cloth or a board, a uh, cardboard that was blue, really a dark blue. And he'd put it up next to the model and he'd say, look back and forth between the, the shadow in the nose and the shadow in the, in, the, in the model's head and this blue. And then you'd realize, oh, right, it's, uh, it's quite warm. Um, but uh, so that relativity of, of colors is, uh, is kind of weird. And I don't know why it's just a kind of natural tendency for all of us to make, make uh, these darks uh, blue. But certainly once you make them warmer, most of them, it just looks right. And, right. uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of funny how that is. And it has so much more depth to it than, than when, you, when it's cold. When it's cold and dark, it's like a, a door gets slid across. Whereas if it's warm and dark, it's like you can go deeper and deeper and deeper. So Jeff, Jeff is saying a lot today. Jeff says, put that back up. I see my name there. Charlie's sketching discipline is a great example of setting yourself up for success. Solve so many hundreds of compositional problems through that discipline. Yes, 
that's that's it precisely is is well it's why i wasn't a good sign painter um jose says hello from chicago member of palette and chisel so yeah why don't you talk another great artist both of those guys are really great artists yeah that's cool Let's have the next slide, Betty Sue. Charbonneau has joined us for a little bit right now. So here we have another, here we have another, um, very, you're using all kinds of uh, Art Nouveau and almost Art Deco tropes in there. And yep. you, this one is a lot of scumbled paint on a warm, uh, on a warm substrate color. So this, this, this. this is another, this is a painting that was a failed painting that I started of um, from a, a kid's rodeo. There's a, just down the street from us here in the country is a, is a, is a friend of ours who uh, trains, uh, mostly young girls come and they practice for the rodeo. And so I'd done a painting of the rodeo and didn't like it. And it had been sitting there for years. And so I just took it, turned it upside down. And I did this painting of Sue's niece, Willow on it. Um, and uh, when she'd come to visit us and uh, so this is, I did the painting mostly all in, um, uh, I did a charcoal of her first and I drew in the background and that's from a photograph I took in Turkey um, of, uh, of, you know, something from probably in Assyrian and stuff. It was in a museum. And so I added that in the background. So I figured this all out in the drawing composition I wanted. And I had Willow pose and we had, I'd gotten some wings off the internet and we had her pose in that. Uh, but I did this from a photograph and so then it was just fun to, to play around. So the parts that you see peeking through the pink at the bottom and little bits of green, that's from that original painting oh, yeah. of the girl on the horse. And then I did this with just um, transparent, I didn't use transparent oxide red, I used just a dark burnt sienna and yellow ochre. Um, and uh, then I added a couple little bits of green and stuff uh, in the, um, I'm sorry, burnt sienna, and ultramarine blue, and then I added a little bit of yellow ochre for the for the, uh, the yellow parts. So yeah, so that that was just kind of a fun painting, really. Well, and and uh, you know, I I get little tiny whiffs it's with the smoke. I, with the word whiff comes to mind, but get <laughs> whiffs of uh, Sargent's uh, the Fumé de Ambergris. Oh yeah, um, I love that painting. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a it's a monster of a painting. But uh, now, uh, speak a little about um, why you would choose burnt sienna over transparent uh, red oxide. Because transparent iron iron oxide was is certainly the Richard Schmid, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I identify that with him. But the two actually they're very similar, but they have some significant differences. Um, yeah. Talk yeah. a little about it. I like them both. They're just, I, I lately I've only been using burnt sienna. I've only used transparent oxide ride probably in the last five years or so. I've only used it now and then uh, when I'm doing things a little more transparently. Um, I mostly just, I don't know why, I've just been mostly using the burnt sienna. I think probably because I've been only ordering the larger tubes because I <laughs> use so much paint. Uh -huh. It feels like squeezing, because I'll squeeze out like a whole pile when I do my, my, my thicker paintings, especially. And uh, with transparent oxide red, I really, really have to squeeze out an entire tube just for one pile of paint. And so I think I went to the burnt sienna just because I've just been ordering large tubes because I use a lot of paint and then I save them in, in mud piles of the different colors. I scrape them to try and use them. So I think that's why I mostly use it. And so I'll usually just put out transparent oxide red when I really need that just specific color. Um, but uh -huh. I find burnt sienna does, especially if you're not painting it real washy uh, and thin, uh, burnt sienna works just as well, really. So Right, right, yeah. right. Um, and actually, I think it has a little bit more. Transparent oxide red gets a little bit uh, are a kind of orange. It, 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 I don't, the burnt sienna seems to have a little bit more kind of gravity to it. I, it, it is a little bit more logical to me. Um, the, the transparent oxide red is so transparent um, right. that it's 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 a little tricky. But I like the, I like the burnt sienna when I'm working when I'm working thicker usually, uh, especially and which is a uh, lot of times. So yeah, it it, it okay. is it, because it's not transparent. It really you know. Right. Next next slide, please, Betty Sue. Okay. 
So this here's something a little bit different. What, what's, what's this one? So this is from, I love, uh, I haven't done it in a couple of years now, but um, I, I usually will take a month and go out west and just paint um, on the spot and camp and, or stay in little hotels, motels and stuff. And then often I would meet up with Matt Smith and Ralph Oberg and Charles Mensch and other friends of mine. And we'll do a pack trip in the Sierra Nevada mountains or in other, other areas. This is from Adiza Lake, one of the places we've gone a couple times. And we'll, we ride horses up there and we have mules that will have all our painting and camping gear. And then we hire a cook to cook the meal so we can just paint. Um, and it only costs like around a hundred dollars a day with the cook because you're just camping. So, and all the food and everything. And so this is one of my little studies in the morning. Uh, I, we usually will do about three paintings, sometimes four each day when we're doing these pack trips. And so I've done tons and tons of those studies. Then when I travel through the month, I'm just doing plein air paintings. And sometimes I'll have people pose for me on the reservations or just people that I meet. And so this is one of the ones I did, these quick little, this is probably like a 10 by 12. And uh, this took me two, two mornings, because when you get up and that first light is hitting, could have even been three mornings. You only have about 15, 20 minutes, and the light is gone. And it's really cold in the morning up there, too. You know, we'll get snow a lot of times in the evenings. And so I will just do a very quick little one, and, I, and I'll, I just, it's just right outside my tent. And so then the next day, I would work on that one again. And um, so that's what that is. It's just one of the quick planner studies. And, oh, yeah. and again, I mean, look at the look at the shadow on the right, ladies and gentlemen. The shadow of the conifer on the right is a warm, is a warm dark, and contrast that with the kind of roseate Payne's gray of the mountain on the left, which is 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 the the difference in temperature there is just is beautiful and and subtle, and I love it. The 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 reminds me a lot of Tom Thompson's. Uh, you know, plein air work from the- I love his work, that whole group of seven. And we've yeah. gone to that museum in Toronto, outside of Toronto, and I just love his work. I mean, we had we had the director of the McMichael, that's the museum you're talking about. Um, yeah. We had the director on a reasonably fine art talk doing a Tom Thompson. Uh, did, it, Th Thompson was amazing, amazing, amazing oh, work. Amazing, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm just so in awe of his work and, and really all that whole group. I mean, they are right. all just got such interesting work. It's so interesting how often you get groups of people who kind of feed off each other's energy and you get this great stuff, you know, it's really cool. Yeah, no, the, 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 that period of Canadian art is fascinating. So next slide, please, Betty Sue. Let's see. Uh, this, is, this is our how to be political without being political. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, this is, uh, this, these are a couple paintings from uh, out West. Uh, and like I said, when I go out for a month, I'll usually do uh, paintings of people. Now the girl on the left uh, holding up the license plate is a girl that I've known since she was, she was 14 years old. And I did a, the museum at the National Cowboy Museum uh, that does the pre to West show had asked me to do a demonstration. And they said they had a, uh, had an older model, but this young girl of, of somebody there they knew who worked there um, wanted to pose, and she was 14. And so she posed for the, the demo, and I knew it was going to be hard for a 14-year-old. So, um, so, but she was just so excited, and we just talked the whole time. I actually put a microphone on her, too, so that when we did the demo. And then when I've gone back a few times, I've, I've hired her and her cousins, and I've done drawings and sketches of them at her grandmother's house, who is just a wonderful... Uh, Nancy, Nancy Mendez. And um, so this is one that I did from the last time that I had gone there and uh, drawn her uh, at her grandmother's house. And then we would take photographs too, outside and inside. And she wore all the things that her and her grandpa, grandmother would make. They'd spend all year making these for the powwows that they'd go to. So it's really their art. And she's so excited to pose in these. Um, but they had this license plate just on the mantle from an older one from their car, but it's the Ponca Nation. And it also says Oklahoma. And uh, so I thought it would be fun to have her pose with that, um, kind of as if she's holding up, obviously, a, um, a uh, you know, it's been arrested, you know, and it's her ID. And uh, in fact, Sue laughed when I was starting this. I started only as a drawing. I didn't even intend to do colors on it. 
And Sue, Sue laughed and she's like, oh my gosh, you know, that's crazy, you know, uh, that pose. And uh, I just loved it. And I loved the subtext of it, you know, mm -hmm. because there's uh, having, you know, uh, been spent time on Indian reservations from when I was in art school. I first went and volunteered at a, one in South Dakota and stayed with a family there. Um, there's just so many interesting issues, which I, I like to write about as well. And um, so, yeah, and, and, and uh, the really cool things, this is Serena. Uh, she's half Panka and half Choctaw. And um, her, she just graduated last year, uh, valid Victorian from her high school and is now in her first year of college. So it's kind of, kind of cool. Yeah. Well, well, and, and you and I have talked about this just um, back channel previous times. Um, you support, you know, I, I went to, I went to Yale. I figure Yale has enough money. Um, mm -hmm. So you support the uh, American Indian College Fund. Uh, That's, I think it's a great one and I've researched it and it's a really, um, you know, a large percentage goes to that. You can go and check out, check out different, um, uh, you know, charities that way and, and really make sure that they're good ones. And I think that's a really good one. And so it's a, it's a difficult thing about where to give money. I, I of course, uh, uh, pay my models when I hire them. And like Serena, I, I don't tell them beforehand when this painting sold uh, at the museum. I'd done a couple others of her that hadn't sold. Uh, but the, when this one sold at the museum and it was, you know, it was surprising how popular this one was. And um uh, so I sent her five hundred dollars as like a as like a, a commission, not commission as a as a bonus, you know, for it. But she didn't know this was coming, so I sent it to her. And her her grandmother wrote and said, "Oh, Serena was so excited because she uh, this was while she was a senior, and she said she didn't know, think she was going to have a very nice uh, 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 dress for her senior prom, and so she used that money to buy the dress she really wanted to buy for senior prom. So that's a great thing, but." Other times when I do paintings, like the one on the right is from a powwow uh, in Idaho that Sue and I went to. We just came across when we were going to stay with our friend George Carlson uh, for a week. And we just camped out in the middle of, you know, this, this, this little village. And it was just a little town, Post Falls, Idaho. And it was on for three days. And people just camped out. It was like tribes from all over the Northwest all came. It wasn't like a, there weren't many other people there, tourists. It was mostly all just Native Americans. And they said, photographs are welcome, can take photographs. You know, it was part of the whole thing. And everybody was excited we were there. So I would make discs and give them to the Native Americans that I knew, uh, ones with horses. But people like this little girl, there were just, you know, there was over, I think, 1,200 people there. So I take a photograph of her and I did a painting of her. Uh, but I don't know her. I don't know her family. There's no way for me to pay her. So giving to, and this was in the, uh, the Autry Museum show, and it sold there. And so giving something to something like the Native American um, in, uh, College Fund is just a great way to uh, kind of be a responsible artist and be using the money that I'm making from my art to also, you know, give something back to these cultures. Um, right. So, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's just a way to do it. I mean, it's, it's not... It's not bragging, and it's important, I think, to explain that you do these things because it encourages other people. Like Serena's cousin uh, went, became like an ambassador to for her for her tribe in Oklahoma to Japan, and was going to go there and and be like kind of the uh, ambassador. But of course, it was going to cost money. So I started a GoFundMe thing on our on Facebook, and we did it. and And she was because she'd raised about five hundred, but she needed like three thousand to be able to go. And so it was great when I did the GoFundMe and then I gave $500, but then all these other people gave money to it. And so she raised the money to go mostly just on that Facebook post. And I just, it just makes you feel so good to be able to do that and to take the profits that you make from your art and from these cultures, other cultures, and to be able to make a positive, uh, you know, uh, contribution right. to it. So it's just wonderful. Right. Well, we have a, we have a technical question here, which is, Sure. Um, Catherine is wondering how you sealed the drawing to then be able to add paint. So, so what was your similar. substrate and what, what was your sealing sealant? So this is very similar. In fact, I just posted today a watercolor that I did on 
watercolor board, which and I, both these, I think, were that was done on a uh, cold press watercolor board, crescent watercolor board. And this was also done, these drawings. A lot of these drawings, I like to do them on the watercolor boards, either cold press or hot press. I'm sorry, hot press, I think, is what I did, the watercolor that I just posted. And so then even with the watercolors, I seal them, then I'll varnish them. Sometimes I'll seal them, seal them with crystal clear first and then varnish them. Um, sometimes just the crystal clear. So this one I did as a charcoal drawing and I used brush and water as well as drawing on it. So like the dark areas, I'm using brush and water. And you can see some of the areas in the bottom which are brush and water. Um, sometimes I'll use acetone. This one was just water. And then when it's dry, then I'll spray it with a fixative and then I'll seal it with crystal clear um, or varnish or both. It is crystal clear sprayed or is it applied it's with sprayed. the brush? Yeah, it's a spray right. that you usually use for drawings. Uh, it's like an acrylic based thing. Um, but I also varnished this then. So it was thoroughly sealed. Then so it's thoroughly, it, it, it's hit with fixative, hit with the crystal clear, and that seals it enough that you can then apply the varnish to it. Right. Right. Okay. And the right. varnish is brushed on as opposed to spray. sometimes I spray it, sometimes I brush on. Mostly on these boards, uh, I might spray it a few times first, but usually then I have to put a brush. Right. That's what I had to do on this last watercolor that I that I did as a demo. Um, I brush it on because it needs to be thicker for because the, the board will will absorb it quite a bit. So you'd right. have to use so many uh, uh, cans of spray, and so the brush will cover it. Then once that was sealed. I actually originally just was still going to leave it as a drawing. And Sue was saying, don't do anything. You're going to ruin it. And, uh, and so I put a couple different colors on her necklace. Um, and then that was going to be it. But then I couldn't help it. I still just kept doing more. I thought, oh, I'd really like to put some more of this kind of uh, um, gold and copper acrylics, which are, if you see the painting in person, they actually have a shine to them. It's like a metallic. Thing. And then I and then and Sue had a good suggestion to add a little more blue at the end. And so I added that. So those were all added as washes on top, washes or even thicker, uh, thicker palette knife strokes of acrylic on top of it. Then once that was all done and I was happy with it, then I varnished it again. And one of the reasons I like to varnish my drawings and watercolors is because, and you can either use matte or glossy or satin, whatever kind of finish you want. But then I can put them in a regular oil frame and I don't have to have glass on them because oftentimes the glass are very glary. And a lot of them, I like to have the, the full value range that will come back when I, when I varnish them. And so, um, so for all, and then it's protected. It's just like an oil painting. If something gets splattered, you can just clean it and wash it off. Um, and so, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about glass breaking or reflections. So yeah, yeah. good, good technical question. Yeah. All right, next slide, please, Betty Sue. And this is this is a quite an older one. This might be, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. And this is a painting I did of Sue, uh, my fantastic painter wife. And this was done. I did this with uh, with the uh, Zorn palette. So it's it's just uh, uh, like an ivory black, um, uh, cadmium red, and yellow ochre. And uh, I actually, it was interesting. I took a photograph of Sue and I did this in my studio. It's life size. And I painted the entire painting and um, just, it came out okay. It was like correct and everything, but it just, I don't know, it just felt boring to me. So after like a, after like a month, I just was like, I just don't like that painting. It just, it's right, but it doesn't, it, it, it's too tight. It's all this. So I actually just turned it upside down and did it again, the same exact painting, just uh, upside down. And then I felt that I did it more, um, more, you know, simpli simplifying brush, brush strokes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and so, so that's that's kind of that's kind of it. And uh, so, yeah. All right. Well, 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 well. Let's see. Catherine asked, "Your values, your drawings change when you seal them." The values change only mainly in the darks. So when I seal them, now, when you spray drawings in general with fixative, they can change a little bit. Um, oftentimes, the darks get a little bit lighter. A lot of the regular drawings I do in my sketch pad or on, on things, I will do the drawing first. I'll do it once, and, I'm, and then I will spray it with a fixative. 
Uh, usually I use workable fixative, a couple of uh, layers of workable fixative. And then I will go back and it will soften some of the darks. Won't be quite as dark as they looked when you first put them in. Then I'll go back over it and I'll just add a few darks, like in the eyes or here or there, a few strokes of, of a darker dark with a nice heavy, um, I, I usually just use vine charcoal. And then I'll spray it again. And those darks will still stay darker then. Mm -hmm. Now, if you then seal them, now some of the regular drawings I just do on paper, I do just put them under, on frame them under plexiglass um, and uh, like a non-glare plexiglass. Uh, so I don't varnish those. Only the ones that I do on um, either a really heavy watercolor paper, but usually on the watercolor boards. Because if you try and varnish them on the actual papers, uh, they're gonna wrinkle. So you'd have to like adhere them to a board, which you can do. Uh, so, but when I have those, then when I varnish those, they will change in the darks. The darks will get richer and more dark, at, you know, because they'll have that kind of glossy look to them. Great. Next slide, please, Betty Sue. And this is the final slide. Let's quickly go boom, boom, boom. Take us one, two, three, Betty Sue. Okay, and then back to the back to the full. Cool. All right. I should have given you more close-ups. Yeah, this is a bigger painting, so it's 36 by 36. So yeah, when you see them on the screens blown down, they look uh, pretty finished. But I played a lot with texture with this with this painting. Yeah. Um, let's let's so, go up. Let's go up to the the fullest texture. Yeah, there you go. So you can see a little of the texture, and that's that way through the whole painting. Um, so, and this was done in many layers. I, I blocked this whole thing in first. Uh, very big washy shapes in the whole background. I took some photos in progress and I'll put that on our Patreon site later. Uh, the pictures yeah, no, in progress. Let me just uh, interrupt here for a second. Betty Sue, I think you should just follow along going in and out as Scott is talking as, as <laughs> makes sense. And then Scott, you said this also is, is one of your most recent paintings, right? Right, I just finished this one maybe two weeks ago. Okay. Uh, so just before I did the interview with you really. Okay. And, and uh, also, one, I'm gonna make one last interjection before I let Scott speak in his perfectly formed paragraphs. Um, <laughs> Scott has a very, very good Patreon. Uh, and I would urge people who are interested in his worldview and his techniques to investigate uh, joining his Patreon. Okay, take it away, Scott. All right, so uh, yeah, so this is again, uh, pretty much all my paintings are experiments. So I blocked this in with big shapes in oil and I let it dry for I think a couple months before I came back to it and started working on it. And this is one of our favorite models, Rose. She's a really good artist who has a, a studio in this building here too. And so this is one from one of the photo sessions I did with her at my studio. And we were just playing around with things. I used two photos for this, one of her face and one of her hands. Uh, the, it, this looks quite different than the photographs, both her face and her hair, everything. Um, honestly, this painting was such a struggle for me. I literally, I started videotaping it for Patreon and I'll put those on there, but I think I videotaped about 20 hours of it. Uh, and I still hadn't got the face right. I'd painted the face over five times while videoing it. Really painted it, repainted it, repainted it. And I kept changing things. I stopped videoing it. I'll use that part of it. And then I took photos in progress because I would put it aside for like a month or two. And then I'd come back to it and repaint it. And I think I did the face over like 11 times I counted. I mean, completely painting it. Realistic, lighter, darker. Um, she would come in every now and then and say, stop, I love it here. And I was like, oh, she goes like, please don't work on this anymore. But it just wasn't what I wanted to go for. And I had completely different patterns in the background, abstract things. And, but I just kept trying things and experimenting. And I finally got it to where I, where I like it. Um, I really obliterated a lot of the face and made it put the values down and just kept playing around with things. And so I finally have it to where I was happy with it, but um, it was a struggle. And I pretty much did abandon it a couple of times and just say, okay, that's when I'll have to just repaint over completely something different. And then I would come back to it. I really liked the idea. So anyway. uh -huh. yeah. it's, it's Betty, so can we go up um, to, to a closer end? Yeah, 
it, that, that it's very interesting to me that the way that you resolved it here has very much that backlit hair with these very kind of decorative color elements uh, and yet her face is so is so soft, so tonal compared to um, these Clint, Clint and Chuck Close like uh, forms uh, that you've that you've kind of put on top. I mean, I see I see pre raphaelite I see Art Nouveau, I see obviously if I'm mentioning Close, you know, contemporary. Um, you know, it feels to me like you're drawing from so much of art, the whole range of art history in creating these images. Are you thinking about other genres and stuff at the time? Or are you just trying to oh, get- Oh yeah. I'm always, you... I'm, I'm always thinking of a lot of those artists. So like I will put books out and look at them before I start a painting too. And, and this one was also, I was looking at a lot of um, Mancini books as well at this time and kind of reading about his life. And so his textural elements are things I love with that. And with Mucha, I love the way he uses his outlines and some of the designs. And certainly Klimt, I love those color elements and designs. And then, you know, the really thick paint is, is, is I, love, I love modern art sorts of things. So I like to have, in fact, when I, when I post a lot of these kinds of paintings, I'm really trying to get push myself to get more and more uh, go farther with that. Because I've always used abstracty kind of backgrounds with things, uh, but they were still very realistic mm -hmm. in other areas. But when I po it's funny when I post pictures like this, where you can where you don't even see the face or different areas of them on Instagram and stuff, I'll have abstract artists who will comment and write and say, "Oh, I'm so happy to see you do abstracts. I love this painting." And then when they see that it's part of a bigger painting, they'll be disappointed. And they'll say, uh, several of them have written me and said, I challenge you to do just pure abstract. I'm like, well, but why? I mean, it's got that element into it. To me, combining the two together is what, what is great. But yeah, I wanted to work on both levels. And yeah, I, I, I'm always like looking at pure abstract artists and ones that aren't abstract. I love the pre-Raphaelites. I'd say Waterhouse is my favorite painter mm -hmm. of all time because of the emotional element. And when you see his paintings, we said at the Petit Palace, uh, uh, when we were in France last year, they have two of his originals in the basement. And when you see them in person, um, it's so abstract the way he uses his brush and stuff in the, you know, in the, uh, in, in the way he applies the paint. And so I think that's very important, but um, so I want both the emotional and I want that. And, and, and I feel like sometimes getting too literal in some of the areas, the face and stuff, it can take away from that emotional story that I'm hoping to get, get through. So that's why I kept repainting it. Cause I was like, the face looks good. It looks, you know, it would be fine, but it didn't work on that level. And so I kept uh, having to, it's sometimes hard for me to get away from painting everything the way I see it, because it's kind of how we learned in school and a lot of these, when I get to halfway point through it, I totally don't look at the pictures anymore for the second half of the painting. That's become my way of painting now. I definitely will block things in. I'm trying to paint them, you know, well and mix the abstract and stuff. But then for the second half of the painting, I, unless I really need to look at something, um, I will just turn the computer off the, the screen or if I have photos, put those away and I will only work on it for the second half of the painting without looking at the references. And I've looked at it enough while I painted it to know everything I need to know about the, right. I could repaint the entire face from, from, from memory of what it looked like, but it really does help me to think about the painting and not think about getting it to look like the photograph or the model if it's from life. Even when I work from life, I do that where I will just get yeah. to a certain point, I will just, only look at the painting and take it back to the studio and just do the, only that. And it's really helped me a lot in the last yeah. couple of years. I think, I think that is a wise thing. Betty, so why don't you make our heads big again? Um, <laughs> make our heads big again and, and, and we will, we'll wrap this up. Um, right. Scott, it is, it has been t great talking with you. I could, I could talk with you for 
hours. So I hope we'll hope we'll do it again. Um, yeah. Scott's uh, website is just scottburdick.com. And you can, uh, as I say, I would really recommend checking out his Patreon. Uh, I think I have a new credit card, so I think my Patreon of his has lapsed. But I have been a happy member of his uh, Patreon community for a while. Um, Jeff wow, that's an honor to know that you've been on there. That's crazy. I will second that Patreon endorsement. Literally the best Patreon for painters. You get two for one of those, Scott and Sue. Contrib yes. Both Scott and Sue contribute incredible content. It's very affordable. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll leave it there with that ringing endorsement from Jeff, Jeff Eikhoff. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you, Betty Sue. Thank you and guys so much. We'll talk again soon sometime. And everyone else, we'll see you next week for another reasonably fine art talk. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>